Good morning. Okay, let's try that again. Good morning. Yeah, this is this is the Fourth of July weekend. Happy Fourth of July. Man, we have a lot to be thankful for today, and we love the Lord, and the Lord loves us. And I just want to welcome every one of you here today, and I pray that the Lord will bless you tomorrow and all week. Um, uh, mm, I think LaDonna covered all the announcements, and we have a lot of good things from God today, so I guess I'll just get right into it. But I do want to wish you a happy Independence Day, and I pray that God will bless you and your family immensely. And uh, the, the name of my sermon today is What Made America Great? And uh, when I thought of this ser sermon, when I was working it out in my head, I was really thinking, I'm just going to do a sermon this week on how good America is. Sometimes, you know, on Mother's Day or Father's Day or, or the Fourth of July or whatever, they, you get a sermon that kind of makes you think that you don't cut the mustard. You know what? They, they, pre they preach on the perfect woman in Proverbs, or, and they lay out the most wonderful father, and you leave thinking, well, that's not me. <laughs> but it really is you. But um, uh, I was just thinking, Lord, I just want to be thankful and praise the Lord for the beautiful nation that we live in, the most blessed nation on earth, and um, uh, so th that was really the ideal I had, and um, uh, I want you to know that it really makes, it, and I think you all know this, it really makes a difference what you believe about God, amen? Did you all believe that, amen? It, w it really makes a difference. A God-fearing people and what they believe can make a powerful difference in God's dealing with them as individuals and as a nation. Scripture gives us powerful truths that tell us that this is true. Now, I'm just going to name one, but the Bible's full of them. Psalms 147-11 says, The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Now, isn't it wonderful to know that the Lord of all creation delights in your love and faith in him? It really makes a difference to God how you feel. Today, I want to stop and take the time to thank God and celebrate the great nation that he has given us. And um, uh, as I was doing this sermon the Lord kind of went on a different direction on me and instead of just Thanksgiving, which we will have plenty of Thanksgiving. Um, uh, but there was a message, a real message, that I felt like was from the Lord, and I'm going to share it with you today. There's many things wrong with our nation, but tomorrow we celebrate our nation's birthday and our independence. And I never went to a birthday party yet. I've never been to one. Maybe you have. But I never went to a birthday party where they bashed the birthday boy or the birthday girl, right? They're always the, 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 the I don't know, I don't think matron of honor is the right word, but that they're always the most important person. They're the ones that get the cake. They get the first bite. And they're, they get all the presents and all the cards. And everybody makes a big deal about them. You just don't bash the birthday boy on his birthday, do you? So instead of going over everything that's wrong with America today, I think a better ideal would be for us to stop and thank God for the nation that we have inherited and that we love so dearly. Amen? We, we need to be thankful for what God has given us. Now, there are many things that Christians should not approve of in America today, but we still have the greatest nation on earth, the most blessed nation on earth, the greatest nation on earth. We are blessed beyond what we deserve. And thank God for all he has given us. And of all of God's blessings, first and foremost, we should thank God for the gift of our sins being completely washed away on Calvary. Amen? Because without that, we wouldn't have a relationship with God. 
That's the beginning of our real freedom. You could be born to America and be a slave every day of your life. But if you come to Jesus Christ and he forgives you for your sins, you're no longer a slave to sin and you're a child of God. And that's where your freedom begins. Second, we should thank God for the freedom to live and worship as we please. Free will goes all the way back to the creation in the Garden of Eden. I mean, that's God gave us free will from day one, minute one, second one. He wants us to be free. He gave us the freedom to choose how we would live. And I believe, besides from our salvation, that that is the most important gift that God has given us. The freedom to choose how we will live and who our God will be. And when you make the right decision on who your God will be, you are either blessed or cursed because of what you think. We've been free to choose the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God has blessed America. That's, that's what happened. Proverbs 14, 34 tells us that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. A nation that lives contrary in disobedience to God's word will sooner or later come to an end. And righteousness exalts any nation. The question I want us to ask ourselves today is what made America great? Now we must understand that God didn't just look at all the nations of the world and he said, them, them Americans down there, they, they look pretty special to me, so I'll just bless them. He didn't just flip a coin and say, well, it, it landed on them. He didn't roll the dice and we were the number that came up. God blessed America for a reason, and the reason was that America had the desire to make God their God and obey his words. I, I hope you realize that America is a Christian nation founded on Christian principles. Now, I've had some long conversations with people, some of them Christians. Um, one of them used to even come here, and uh, there, there's a lot of people that, that don't believe that America was founded on Christian principles. And when you go back and you study the history, the true history, I don't know how you could ever come to that conclusion. We know that God blessed Israel. God chose Israel to be his people. But I think it's fair to say that the ancestors of America, our forefathers, chose God to be their God. And because they did that, we have lived under the blessings of God almost ever since. And because they chose to love God, God blessed them, and he continues to bless us today. They were a group of people who loved God and wanted to live by his word and in a way that would honor him. There is multitudes of evidence that the founding fathers of this great country loved God. Uh, around the top of the Liberty Bell, which was made way back in the beginning, way back in, in the 1700s, are the words proclaim liberty throughout the land to all of its inhabitants. That is a word for word quote from Leviticus 25.10. So when they were starting out and they wanted to make this great bell that symbolized America, they put scripture right at the very top. That's where you find that scripture, right written on the top line of the Liberty Bell. George Washington wrote, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and to humbly implore his protection and favor. Uh, George Washington also wrote, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. George Washington was a Christian. The signers of the Declaration of Independence, John Adams and John Hancock, on April 8th, 1875, now that's way back in the beginning, 1775, said, we recognize no sovereign God, no sovereign but God, and no king but Jesus. These, these people believed in the Bible. Now, they, may, they weren't Nazarenes, because we know the Nazarenes don't even go back that far. And they may, they may, I don't know if they were Methodist or what they were, but what, they, what, what, they, what we do know is that they believed in God and they lived and governed America like they believed in God. 
When one studies Abraham Lincoln's presidential speeches and letters, there are filled with references to the Bible that demonstrate his dependence upon prayer for God's guidance. It is difficult to comprehend anyone would perceive President Lincoln as anyone but a man that sincerely depended upon God. David Joshua Brewer, you don't know him, but he was an associate justice at the Supreme Court way back in 1892, and he said our laws and our institutions must necessarily be based upon and embody the teaching of our Redeemer, which is Jesus, of mankind. It is impossible that it should be otherwise. And in this sense, and to this extent, our civilization, our nation, and, our, and its institutions are emphatically Christian. Genesis 12, 2 says, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and though all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, we've already said that when God said those words, he was talking about the nation of Israel. And to this very day, God has kept that promise. He has blessed Israel, and he has given them a great name. But I can't help but notice that every word in Genesis 12, 2, you could use to describe America. Amen? It says, I will make you a great nation. I think God's done that. I will bless you, and I will make a great name, make your name great. God has done it. We have a great name among nations. You will be a blessing. We have been all over the world. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Those nations that have attacked America have paid dearly. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Now, we're not responsible for the Savior like the Israelites were. But we are responsible for taking the gospel of the world all over the world. Amen? Look at Genesis 12, 1. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's house to a land I will show you. Now this is just my opinion. But I can't help but notice that when God decided to create a new nation for himself, a new people for himself, he chose a group and he took that group of people and he sent them to a land where they did not know where they were going. He, told, he said, Abraham, go. As you go, I'll show you where to go. And you just keep obeying. You just keep following my lead. He was starting over, making it himself a new people and a new nation. It was a journey of faith. And when they obeyed, God blessed him. When the Israelites f fell out of favor with God and into slavery in Egypt, when God redeemed them, I can't help but see again that he takes his people to a journey to a new land. That is exactly what our ancestors did. did they, they got on a ship and traveled to a new world in search of freedom to worship God. They, they knew more about God than the Israelites. And knew, they knew more about God. They had more of God's, we have more of God's word. We have the whole Bible today. Moses just had what God spoke to him. It's a, it was a journey of faith to a place they had never seen before. Can you think of leaving your home, your family, and everything you have, and traveling to a place that you had never seen, that you didn't know where you were going, and you knew was wild? It took faith and courage to believe that their God had something better for them, even though they had no evidence to prove it. At least Moses had the word of God. God said, you go where I send you and I will bless you and make you into a great nation. Our ancestors were saying that they were believing that if we honor God, then he will bless us. They had never been to America or they had never met anyone who could tell them about America. They knew it was a wild, undeveloped land fraught with dangers but they believed that God would honor their faith in him, and they traveled to the new world. What made these people wise beyond their understanding was what 
they believe about God and what their God would do for him. Amen? That, that, that's what makes Christians different from the rest of the world. What they believe that their God will do for them. There's, a, there's all kinds of people. Almost everybody in America has heard the gospel message. They, they heard that Jesus died for their sins, that Jesus will take forgive them for whatever they've done, that Jesus will make them part of their family. Why aren't they Christians? Because they don't believe. When you don't believe God, it goes against you. They envisioned a new world where God would be almighty and bless them. They believed that God could and would do this for them. I got to tell you, one of the things that gets me down is when I talk to people who say they're Christians and they limit God and what he can do. Amen? I want you to know that there's nothing that you need. There's nothing, period, that God can't do. And the difference on whether he will do it for you or not is probably what you believe is that he can do. Amen. Does that kind of make sense to you? Do you kind of see where I'm coming from? If you, it tells us in the Bible that if we lack faith, God can do nothing for us. So if you don't believe that God can bless you, then he probably won't. Even though we're all blessed under the umbrella a blessing that God puts over America. They obeyed the Spirit's leading and journeyed by faith to a new land of milk and honey. I think if you describe America, it's a land of milk and honey. We have everything we need here. Today that land is called America, and we're the most blessed nation on earth. And we need to thank God for the people who risked everything for the chance to worship God and the way their hearts dictated. See, one of the wonderful things about America is written into our Constitution, into our Bill of Rights, is that we have the right, and it's a right given to us by God, and through the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, no one can take that right to worship God away from us. We all get to worship however we want. If you want to play, pray to Buddha, you can pray to Buddha. If you want to play, to play to Muhammad, you can play to Muhammad. If you want to be a Satanist, you can be a Satanist. But if you want to be a Christian, you have that right. And that's what the people who came here in the early days had. They believed in God. Of the 103 people who sailed on the Mayflower, 45 died in that first winter. These people risked everything they had, including their lives, so that they could worship God according to the dictates of their heart. We should never let anybody tell us how or who to worship. Amen? Now, we all worship the great, the almighty God and his son, Jesus Christ. Genesis 12, 2 says, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. That's what God says he will do for the nation whose God is the Lord. Today, what God says he will do, he does. He's done. Today, God has blessed America, and we are the greatest nation. And he has given us a great name. We have a great name amongst all the nations. Man, I can remember when I was in the Marines, and everywhere we went, almost, People wanted to take their pictures with the American Marines. Not just because we were Marines, but because we were Americans. I remember when I was in Korea, and we were right on the border of the demilitarized zone, and all the little Koreans, and I have some of the pictures in my picture album, wanted to, take their, wanted to get their picture taken with an American. Another thing that we are is God has made us a blessing to all nations. We have always fought tyranny, and we are fighting tyranny and evil today. But more than that, America has sent more missionaries armed with God's gospel out into the world than any other nation. The true blessing of America to all the other nations in the world is the fact that we have sent the gospel around the world. 
your church, the Church of the Nazarene, was organized right here in Texas, not too far from here, in 1908. It was just a few hundred people. The Church of the Nazarene has grown over to over 30,000 congregations with 2.5 million members in 164 nations in the world. How did that come to be? Because the Church of the Nazarene made it a priority to send missionaries all over the world sharing the gospel. Every time we collect in this church, we send 10%, 10 to the mission field. And every Nazarene church does the same thing. And that adds up to millions and millions of dollars that the Church of the Nazarene spends building hospitals, churches, and sending missionaries out so that the people around the world can be free from their sin. Amen? Now, this is important, people. I need for you to hear this. This message is what I believe, and I haven't got quite to it yet, what God wants us to do today. Amen? Now, and that's just our church. There's all kinds of other denominations who are doing the same thing, who are sending missionaries out into the world so that the world can be free from sin and slavery. What makes America great is our faith in our God and the belief that he will bless and honor those who honor him. Our greatness is not determined by our leaders, our wealth, or our military. Even those, those things are byproducts of it. America is great because we have a great God, because we have chosen to obey his word as a nation. But today, many Americans are turning their backs on God and God's word and embracing radical lifestyles that do not honor him or his word. Amen? Come on now, amen? I hope you all agree with me because I'm preaching the truth. We should pray and ask God to turn this nation back into a God-fearing nation that we once were. We should vote for people who embrace the values that America was founded on. I was really long about Tuesday praying, Lord, where do you want me to go with this message? What do you want for your people? And as I prayed, I felt like God gave me the answer. What does God require of his people? What does it mean to do the work of God? And th this is where God led me. John chapter 6, verses 27 and 29. Jesus tells us just what his work is in these verses. Just what we should be doing. Jesus tells us, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. So it's just not physical food, but it's the word of God. God's written word. God, it's God's spiritual food which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then the people asked him when he said this, then they asked him, what must we do to do God's works? The work of God. Jesus answered them, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And as I prayed, I felt like the Lord laid on my heart that if we truly believe in the one that God has sent, Jesus Christ, then we would do the work Jesus commissioned us to do in Matthew 18, verses 18 and 20. Here Jesus makes it clear what he wants for his people again. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And utterly I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus guarantees his blessing. He says, I will, if you do this that I'm asking you, I will be with you always, literally to the end of the age. The top priority for God's people is always leading people to Jesus Christ. You obey his word 
and you teach other people to do the same thing. What God wants for America today is for his children to get back to leading people to Christ. For, for 100, 200, 150, 200 years, America's churches led the way in America. There was a time when if you were going to go to court, if you could get your pastor to testify that you were innocent, that was just about enough to get you off. Today, no one listens to the pastors of the world except for the Christians sitting in the seats in front of them. Christian laws can make people live, can't make people live for God. The Ten Commandments didn't make people live for God in the Old Testament. It only showed what God desired for his people to be. Amen? When God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments, they would obey for a while, and then they would fall into sin. And then God would revive them, and they would obey for a while, and then they would fall into sin. And it was just a pattern that repeated over and over and over. More man-made laws won't change America. The fact is, American laws come right out of the Bible. You know the, you know the law? What, what's one of the laws? Thou shalt not, you can't murder anybody. <laughs> Thou shalt not murder. You can't steal. Thou shalt not steal. You're not supposed to lie. Thou shalt not lie. All the laws we have come right out of the Bible. It's called the American Judeo ethnic laws. The fact that America's laws come right out of the Bible, though it makes them right, but it doesn't make, give us the power to change who we are. Laws don't make people obey. The Spirit of God living in them makes them obey. People who have God's living in their heart, live in a way that honors God, no matter what kind of laws there are. Amen? A Christian living in Russia lives for God. And an atheist living in America lives for himself. It, it, it matters what's in your heart, not what the laws are. Now, it helps if you have Christian laws, but the only thing that can lead you to obey and please God is faith in him and accepting him into your heart and letting him live there. His spirit will give you the power to overcome. So what we need to do in America is change one person at a time until all Americans have Jesus living in their heart. Amen? That seems like a big job, but you don't have to do it all. All you have to do is change the people in your sphere of influence. The people you work with, the people you go to school with, the people you meet, your family, the people you love. The Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, Psalms 33, 12. Psalms 33, 12 mentions God twice. The names of God mentioned in Psalms 33, 12 mean much more than just the word God. If you say God, that entails a lot. Amen? I mean, it's much bigger than just God. The word God in Psalms 33, 12 in the original language, in the Hebrew, was Elohim. And Elohim, Elohim, Elohim means the God of all creation. The God. God who created everything out of nothing. The God who spoke the universe into existence. Do you see how the word God and Elohim differ? When, when, when we say God, we think of, oh, that's that guy that we all love. And when you say Elohim, you think of the guy who made the universe and spoke it into existence. All powerful, all knowing, no limitations. And the word Lord was Jehovah. In the Hebrew language, Jehovah means Heavenly Father, Almighty God, the Supreme Being, the leader of everything. This verse strongly stresses an Almighty God who can do anything. Going back to what we believe makes a difference in what God does in, the life, in our lives as individuals and as a nation. Our God can do anything, including transforming society one person at a time into God-believing people. Amen? 
The question is, do we believe, like our forefathers, that our God can and will transform America back into a Christian nation? If we do, then there's much work that we need to do. There's much work that we need to get done. As followers of Christ, the word makes it clear again what we should be doing. Listen to 1 Peter 2, 13 and 15. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to, to the emperor or the supreme, as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. God wants us to set the example by doing good, his kind of good. Acts 5.29 says, and the only time we should disobey the authorities in the land is when their lands, their, their laws, what they wanted to do goes against the word of God. Acts 5.29, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than man. Our duty is to obey God first and man second. When the laws of man violate the laws of God, our first allegiance is to our Lord. But we must work to change those laws in the framework of our nation to democracy. Every election makes a difference and every vote counts. That's the way we change our political world, is through voting. And even much deeper, praying, amen? We need to be praying. Over the last couple of weeks, we've seen some amazing things happen in America. I don't know if, if you follow politics, but one of the things that has happened is the Supreme Court has overturned Roe versus Wade. And I want you to know, for me, that, that's just such a blessing. Now, I believe that women should have the right to choose what they do with their bodies. But I'm not going to go in and explain all that. Why do I say that it's such a blessing? Because I don't believe America should be in the business of passing laws that breaks God's laws. And abortion breaks God's laws. God said, thou shall not murder. Listen to Psalms 106, verse 38. This is one of my favorite scriptures that I believe that we can put into the, into the abortion conversation. It says, they shed innocent blood the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan and the lamb was desecrated by their blood. The, the, the Jewish people, at one time, they were doing these things. And God said, no, you can't do that. But today, Americans shed the innocent blood of their sons and daughters on the altar of freedom through abortion every day. The freedom they worship is the freedom to live separate and apart from God's word. And that is not good. It is not good for us individually, and it is not good for us as America. Also, last week, the Supreme Court ruled in the case of Kennedy versus Bur Birmingham School District that says that public employees have the right to pray in public places. This was brought on because a high school coach named Joe Kennedy was told he could not pray on the football field after a game. I want you to know, know that this supports us as Christians. This, this is God's protection that he built right into America so that no one could take our right to worship away. Praise the Lord that our Constitution is alive and well and that religious freedoms have been restored to all religious people in this great country. And I don't mean just Christians. Uh, uh, Muslims can pray to who they want. That's their right. Uh, Buddhist people can pray to who they want. But we as Christians get to pray anywhere we want to our God. And no one can stop us. And that's what that decision said. Praise God that our forefathers put guarantees into our Constitution that protect the right of all Americans to thank, to, to worship the way they please. We should thank God for their wisdom. I'm going to end with this last little section. And it is one of the things that, it's a document that was written in 1830 by a French philosopher named Alex D. To Corville. Now, I don't know if I said that name right or not. 
it's got almost every letter in the alphabet in that name. But he wrote, he, he came to America and he toured America for two or three years and he went back to France and he wrote a book, What Makes America Great. And this, is, this is the paraphrase of that book. In 1830, it says, this is what he wrote about America's greatness. I have toured America and I have seen most of what you have to offer. I've seen the richness of the fields and the wealth of your mines. I've seen your industrial might, the beauties of your rivers and streams, the lakes and the grandeur of your mountains. I've noticed the abundance of the forest and the marvelous climate with which you are blessed. Obviously, it wasn't in Corpus in the summertime. In none of these things did I see the cause for the greatness of America. It wasn't until I went into the churches that I saw the reason for America's greatness. America is great because America is good. As long as America is good, America will be great. If it ever ceases to be good, it will cease to be great. And that's what he wrote. And, and that's the truth. The real question is, does America still want to be good like God is good? When he went into the American churches, he saw God's kind of goodness. Amen? He saw God's ways. He saw an America that believed that God loved them, cleansed them from their sins, and in return, they did good unto the brothers and sisters all over the land and all over the world. And do we as people still believe that the eyes of the Lord are upon this nation and that he will bless those who choose to do his will? You know, as Americans, we don't need to pass more Christian laws. We have, if we just enforce the laws that we have, we will be blessed. Amen? Just like we've seen in the last couple of weeks. What we need is to make more Christians in America, more people who can love God and who can do his will and who will live for him. Can you imagine what America would be like if everybody lived for God? We would need no prisons. We would need no jails. There would be a sheriff in every town, but he'd be like Andy, probably wouldn't even have a gun. He wouldn't have to arrest anybody. There wouldn't be any wouldn't be all kinds of things that we have now. America would be different. We would have an American society. No, we wouldn't have an American society. We would have a Christian society based on what God loves and on his word. And people would do it because it was what was in their heart. Now today, I want you to know that you have much to be thankful for. America is still the greatest nation. And, and I love her immensely. I am very, I am, it, if you don't know it already, and you probably do, but some of you haven't known me as long, I am very patriotic. I believe in America. And I still believe in America. Because the thing that America has going for it is our God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We've chosen the right God. And even though a lot of Americans have moved away from God, there are still a lot of Americans praying that we will do the right thing. But we must, as Americans, get back to the number one priority for which God put us here. And that is leading people to Jesus Christ. Amen? And I know it's not easy. I try to do it all the time. It's... It's not an easy thing to do. It's one that has to be bathed in prayer to God. If you're trying to lead someone to, to Jesus Christ and you're not praying for them, you're not going to have much success. The power to change America and the people's hearts is in the power of prayer. We need to pray. That's why at 9 o'clock, on Sunday morning, we open this auditorium to pray just for that, that our church would turn into a place where people could come and meet God from people who love God and who love them. And um, uh, 
we do have people praying every week, but not near as many people as we ought to probably. And that doesn't mean that you're not praying at home. You can pray at home between 9 and 9.30 just as good as you can pray here between 9 and 9.30. But we need to be praying, and we need to be leading people to Jesus. If America is going to continue to be great, then we need to change America back into a Christian nation. Amen? I, I, I hope you realize what a tremendous last two weeks we've had in the, in the world. The fact that our Supreme Court upheld Christian rights over that of the world, 50 years it took to change that mistake. And, and I will have to admit to you, I don't have all the answers on abortion. I know there's ladies who feel that they're in such a place that they have no other option. But then I also know that there's Christians who can come along beside those people and tell them the truth and be a blessing to them. That's what we have to do. We have to reach out and be a blessing to everybody. And some of those people will say, why did you do that? And then you can tell them because Jesus loves you. Amen. People really don't care what you think. People really care about what you do. If you bless them enough, sooner or later, they'll ask you why you're doing it. Because that's not the way of the world. The world doesn't bless people for no reason. But Christians bless people because of their God tells them to. Love those people. Love those people to me. We pray people to Christ, and we love people to Christ. And if we'll do that, our nation will once again be great. Amen? I hope, I hope that rings true to you, and I hope you have a happy Fourth of July. Let's, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we, I love you today. I hope that we were hearing with our ears what you had to say to us. I believe that this message is what you want for every Christian in America, that we should be busy leading other people to Jesus Christ. And that's how we'll change America. And we don't necessarily have to be great, but you've made us great, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you for all the blessings you have given us. We thank you for the for salvation from sins and the freedom to live in the way that we choose. And we love you today, Lord, and we praise you and we give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful Fourth of July.